Horror Stories, Part 4, The Great Zeppelin Campaign, 1915 through 1918. On the night of May 31st, 1915, the great dark shadow of German airship LZ-38 loomed over above the clouds of London, the size of an ocean-going liner. It sailed through the sky at a steady 80 kilometers per hour, 50 miles per hour. Four powerful edges made such a defending groan. Conversation between the Captain Erich Linzar and his crew was almost impossible. Though gaps in the clouds, the city could be seen clearly enough. Londoners were not expecting any kind of attack, and the lights of the West End streets and playhouse blazed brightly below. The capital's inhabitants felt perfectly safe. The western front was reassuring, was a reassuring distance away, and German warships, which sometimes attacked British coastal towns, lacked lacked the range to hit this far island, this far inland. Linzar's looked around, feeling rather pleased with himself. He later reported not a searchlight or anti-aircraft gun was aimed at us before the first bomb was dropped. He gave a curt nod to the bar barter. Close by in the control cabin, and 150 bo bombs raised, rained down on the city below. Watching from their lofty perch, the crew could observe their bombs exploding. It was exhilarating. It was an exhilarating display. Fires broke out and buildings collapsed. And all 40 people, 42 people died or were seriously wounded that night, and worse was to come. The capital was visited by zeppelins, as the huge airships were known. Throughout the summer, named after their great inventor, Ferdinand, Gareth von Zeppelin, who had been flying these massive hydrogen-filled bay, bay moths since 1897, they seemed to be per the perfect weapon. Londoners grew to have these sinister raiders. Although they did relevantly little actual damage, the disruption and harm to mor morale they caused was formidable. Whenever the a raid was on, traffic ground to a halt. People started fear stared fearfully at the sky and all electric lights were extinguished. When the bombs began to drop, people crouched in alleyways and cellars. In alleyways and cellars, they whispered in dread in case their voices carried up to betray them. They were even afraid to strike a match to light a cigarette in case the fire caught the attention of the Zeppelin bombarder. Despite its huge size, the Zeppelin was almost invulnerable. Its main opponent, a fi the fighter plane, could not fly high enough to attack it. Even when improvements in aircraft design allowed fighters to reach the altitude of the Zeppelin, they still could not climb very quickly, so the invader would be long gone by the time the fighters got there. When the attacks began, 26 batteries of anti-aircraft AA guns were placed around London, and searchlights lit up the night sky with their bright ra raper beams. But these guns were also a new invention. The science of hitting flying machines, even ones as big as zeppelins, was complex. 
hitting a moving target at that range and priming a shell to explode as a particular height were deadly arts yet to be perfected. When war first broke out, the German K K Kaiser Wellem the second would not allow the zeppelins to be used over England. He was closely related to the British royal family, and he knew that bombing from the air would bring civilian casualties and severe family disapproval. Disapproval, but it soon became apparent that the war would not be over quickly. Instead, it turned into a deary stalemate with no end in sight, and the Kaiser's own generals persuaded him that his duty was to use whatever advantage Germany might have. So in early January 1915, the first Zeppelins appeared over the east coast of Britain, bringing massive disruption and anxiety. In this early stage of war, the only threat the Zeppelin crew's face was the weather. Something so large and so ungainingly was always going to be vulnerable to a strong wind. Zeppelins crashed in storms, but nothing the enemy could throw at them had any effect. These days, we have spy state lines and distant early warning DEW do radar systems to give us advancing warnings within seconds of any potential enemy missile or bomber attack, even from the other side of the world. During the First World War, such technology had scarcely been imagined, let alone made available. Said the British had to rely on a network of human spotters placed along the coast, much as they had done for the arrival of Spanish Armada during the time of Queen Elizabeth I, but the Zeppelin spotters had at least the advantage of being able to report their sightings by telephone, rather than a chain of bonfires. They also used a cumbersome device called a othrophone, a huge trumpet like, lis like listening a apparatus designed to detect the distinct drone of the Zeppelin engines. As the war dragged on, the design of fighter aircraft and AA guns raced forward. In 1914, flimsy, pl flimsy planes could barely fly the English canal channel, but by 1916, the British had developed both aircraft and AA guns, which were capable, at least in theory, of hitting the vast, slow-moving Zeppelins. They also armed their aircraft with in incendiary bullets, which were fired from machine guns mounted above the plane's cockpit. These projectiles with which glowed white hot when discharged, were intended to set the highly flammable Zeppelins alight. The Zeppelin crews carried no parachutes. The available weight of these huge machines could lift into the air was limited, and fuel, fuel and bombs were given priority, priority over the crew's safety. Once the Zeppelin caught fire, the crew had virtually no chance of escape, but such we weapons were a great danger to the British pilots too, often exploding when used. As Zeppelin crews reported near missiles and lucky escapes from anti-aircraft fire on the ground, it was quickly decided that night attacks would be safer. As it turned out, they were also tremendously harmful. Curiously, it was the threat of attack, more than any actual damage done, which caused, mo which caused the most harm. 
If zeppelins were detected in the night sky, the order would be given to extinguish all lights below. This blackout, as it became known, caused huge disruption and inconvenience, especially to factories and other local industries. But the blackout had also effective. Zeppelins sent out huge, powerful flares, hoping to find their way by briefly illuminating the land below. But launching such devices gave their position away to night fighter pilots and vigilant AA batteries. As the Zeppelins became more vulnerable to attack, they adopted more effective methods of defending themselves. Machine guns were mounted on top of their vast holes. Manning them took special courage and stamina. A gunner would be tethered to his precious position. Exposed to both machine guns of attacking fighter planes and freezing high altitude temperatures and air currents. If he was injured or overcome by either, rescue was impossible. One ignition device employed to protect a Zeppelin crew was the cloud car, shaped like a fairground rocket ride. The car and its single passenger would be lowered from the interior Zeppelin by a long cable that would dangle its load 800M half a mile below. The idea was that the Zeppelin would lurk inside thick clouds safely concealed from air and AA attack. While the cloud car dangled in the clear air beneath, too small to be seen in the vastness of the sky, its passenger in communication with the Zeppelin via a telephone line would then direct the ship towards its target. It was hair-raisingly dangerous job. One cloud car passenger was dashed to death on a cliff when his Zeppelin flew too low over the coast. If the cable jammed or snapped, the cloud car passenger was totally at the mercy of any enemy warplane that might spot him, and yet he could also be hit by bombs dropped there, dropped from his own Zeppelin. Yet, despite these additional dangers, there was no shortage of volunteers for cloud car duty. Astonishingly, this was mainly because its passenger was allowed to smoke. An activity expressly thingly forbidden in the Zeppelin itself. With its highly inflammable hydrogen package fuel league. Fuel usage. For almost two years, the Zeppelins were able to roam at will over Britain. Their greatest foes, the weather, and their own occasional structural failures. But on September 2nd, 1916, everything changed. That evening, the crew of German airship SL-11 and Lieutenant William Leafy Robinson, a pilot of 39 squadron of the Home Defense Wing, Royal Flying Corps, were about to earn their place in history. As the wet and dairy day drew to a close, close, 16 airships from the German Navy and Army services took to the air and began their long journey through the darkening skies over the North Sea. This was the largest fleet of airships so far assembled by the Germans, and their target was to be the British military headquarters in London. Not all Zeppelin. Not all were Zeppelins. Half of the fleet had been manufactured by the rival airship from firm, Schuett Lanz, who made their flying machines with wooden rather than light metal frames for the British. For the British, however, such differences were academic. The Schuett Lanz airships were equally formidable. formidable. SL-11, for example, was 174M, 5,700 5, feet long, and 21M, 700 feet high. It could carry a similar number of bombs. 
Robinson and his fellow pilots had a new anti-Zeppelin weapon to their arsenal. Although it was one they had very little confidence in, the British had been using incendiary bullets against airships for as long as they'd been trying to shoot them down. However, today, these bullets had proved ineffective. New, more powerful incineraries had been developed, but so far the results had been disastrous. The new type of bullet was prone to explode in the weapon firing it, and almost 20 British airplanes had been destroyed trying to use it. As night fell, radio operators at listening stations picked up a noticeable increase in German wireless communications, suggesting a massive raid was in progress. Spotters along the coast were informed and began to scan the skies for any incoming airships. By 10 o'clock that evening, the airship fleet had been detected as it approached the Nor Norfolk coast. The massive... The massive sound of these combined engines hinted the size of an attack. London AA gun batteries and airfield were alerted. Wait, London AA guns, batteries, and airfields were alerted. Over on Stutton's Farm Airfield, 30 km, 20 miles, southwest of London, Lieutenant Robertson prepared his BE-2 biplane for takeoff. These lumbering two-seater planes were normally used as reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance aircraft, but their wide wings were powerful, and powerful engines enabled them to fly higher than many of the faster, more agile fighters in the Royal Flying Corps. As the BE-2S, BE-2s, earmarked to intercept Zeppelins, usually only carried one crew member rather than two. The lack of extra weight helped the plane climb, fa climb higher. Still, Robinson headed off into the moonless sky just half, half past eleven. That night, he would be one of six pilots out to try their luck in dangerous skies over the capital. These days flying at over 1.5 km one mile every three seconds modern jet fighters can reach high altitudes in a matter of minutes. In 1916 it took an entire hour for Robinson Robinson's BE-2 to reach 3000 m 10,000 feet Peering through the velvet sky, hoping to spot a looming black hole, he could see nothing, even switching off his engine in hope of hearing the approaching airships. Just one in the morning, while flying over the docks at Gravesons, Robertson spotted a Zeppelin, the LZ-98, turning into attack. He unleashed a hail of bullets onto the vast body of the airship. Nothing happened, except that soon the crew realized they were being attacked. They executed a standard Zeppelin procedure. The LZ-98 rose swiftly in the air, way out of reach of the BE-2. But just as Robinson gave up and turned away, he caught sight of something else lurking in the clouds below. A searchlight had illuminated another ship. It was the SL-11 returning home after dropping its bombs on the northern suburbs of the capital. Half an hour earlier, the airships had been focused of most anti-aircraft guns that the, of the north and central London that they had failed. But the volume of fire bursting around the SL-11 had convinced its captain, Captain William Scram, to turn his giant ship around and head further north. As Robinson wheeled in to face his enemy, the SL-11 vanished into a bank of clouds. Twenty minutes passed, then just when he was 
contemplating returning home before his fuel ran out, Robinson spotted the airship again. AA guns were firing up at him, and searchlights occasionally caught the hue, the hole in their beam. He turned his BE-2 to face the shadow. This time, he was determined not to let his query slip away. But just as he was preparing his fire machine gun, the plane rocked alarmingly, buffed by an explosion just underneath him. The AA guns below were also firing up at the airship, exploding at the height they get their target was flying. They had no idea a British plane was up there, too. In those days, pilots did not have radios to alert their comrades below. But the Royal Flying Corps did have a procedure for such emergencies. The pilot could fire off a flare and let the AA gunners know he was up there. But Robinson knew this could also warn the airship crew that he was stalking them. So he pressed on, hoping his own play would not be hit. The BE-2 approached its target from below, swooping over the front of the hole. Then, the vast shadow loomed over him. Robinson began to fire his incinerated bullets into the great gas-filled body of the ship. His highly detailed account of the attacks made for a vivid read. I made nose down in the direction of the Zeppelin. I saw shells bursting that night. Tracer shells flying around it. When I drew closer, I noticed the anti-aircraft aim was too high or too low. Also, a good many some 800 feet. 240M behind. I flew along about 800 feet below it. From, from bow to stern and disrupted one drum of, of ammunition along it. It seemed to have no effect. As he began pace, placing a fresh magazine on his machine gun, a tricky process, as he had to fly at the same time, the airship machine gunners opened up. He weaved away into the black night, then headed in for a second attempt, firing all alongside of the airship. His, his, he attempted his entire ammunition drum, and still nothing happened. On that run, he flew so close to the crew control car, he could see the silhouettes of men inside. Perhaps they were not aware he was attacking them. After all, they were engrossed in their bombing of territory. Below, the roar of their own engines would have prevented them from hearing his tiny plane. By now, Robinson was, fe was to feel angry that Incineries obviously pose far more danger to the pilot firing than to the airship they were aiming at. But risking attack from the guns of both Germans and his own side, he flew in for a third time. As close as he, close as he dared, then I got close behind it. And by this time, I was very close. 500 feet, 150m or less below and concentrated one drum on one part underneath the rear. I had basically finished the drum before I saw the part fired at glow. When the third drum was fired, there were, there were no searchlights on the Zeppelin and no anti-aircraft was firing. I quickly got out of the way of the falling Zeppelin and began, and being very excited, fired off a few red very light and dropped a parachute flare. Something awesome had happened inside the body of the airship. The gas bag where he concentrated his fire had ignited, lighting up the inside of the hole like a magic lantern. Then the stern of the airship burst open in an immense explosion which tossed his tiny plane like, pa like a paper dart in a gale. Fire quickly spread along the entire body of the ship. Once he regained control of his plane, Robinson could see many of the crew throwing themselves out of the Zeppelin to avoid being burned to death. He let off his flares because he was determined the AA gunners below should know 
It was he who had drowned the airship and not them. As he turned his plane to return to the airbase, he knew the SL-11 had crashed into the ground. So bright the b was the blazing hole that he could make out the shapes of houses all along the outer rim of northeast London. Robinson had proved it was possible to down these huge machines, despite the early hour. All over London, people rushed out into secret, rushed out into streets to sing and dance. Church bells rang, sirens wailed, ships and horns, motor horns tooted. The airships had caused such dread for so long, but now it seemed there are way of hitting back at them. There was a way of hitting back at them. For the German airship. Cruise was still approaching the city over the flatlands of Suffolk, Suffolk and Cambridgeshire that night. A huge, the huge blaze lighting up the sky in the far distance was an ominous sight. Their airships were not indestructible after all. Perhaps the demise of SL-11 affected their performance. Because the raid of, on London that night was not a success, although the 16 airships dropped a huge number of bombs between them. Only four people were killed and another 12 injured. Damage to buildings was put at 20, 21,072 pounds in comparison. 16 trained airmen aboard SL-11 had lost their lives and their 94,000 pounds airship had been destroyed. SL-11 fell to earth behind the Logue Inn pub by the village of Cuffley, Hertfordshire. The next day, the village was besieged by sightseers, besieged by sightseers. And the country lanes nearby were clogged with cars, carts, and bicycles, and pedestrians. They burned out frame and tingled, tangled steel and wire with the broken gondolas and smashed engines. It was a starting, startling sight to the side of the wreckage. The green tarp. To the side of the wreckage, a green tarpaulin was laid on the ground to hide the charred remains of those members of the crew who had not leaped to their deaths. Other bodies would be found in the next few days, scattered over the countryside on SL-11's last doomed flight path. Robinson's method of attack, a sustained burst of incendiary fire at one concentrated spot was immediately passed on to all other fighter pilots, likely to encounter a German airship. S Such daring deserved reward. Robinson was presented with the Victoria Cross, the highest award for bravery that can be given to members of the British Armed Forces. But thereafter, the, f the fortunes of his 21-year-old fighter pilot declined. He was shot down over a German-occupied France eight months later and spent the rest of the war in a prison camp where he was badly treated because he had shot down the Essel L-11. At the end of the war, he became one of many mil millions of victims of a massive flu epidemic that swept through the world and died on New Year's Eve 1918. Robinson's victory had an impact far beyond the simple destruction of one airship. The swaggering confidence that airship's crew had displayed in their mess halls and barracks was gone. Nights away from flying duty were haunted by dreams of burning airships. Now they were no longer invulnerable. Like the gods of ancient Greece or Rome, casting death and destruction down from the skies, they were too flesh flesh and blood. And when death came, as it did with increasing regularity, the entire crew would perish. From then on, the Zeppelin's raids grew less frequent and more costly. 
from the spring of 1917, German Gotha bombers were sent over London instead. They were faster, flew higher, and could defend themselves from fighter pilots more effectively. Yet the Germans still nursed high hopes for their magnificent airships by the end of the war. The latest modeled Zeppelins were even earmarked for raid on New York. Luckily for the Americans, the war ended before such an attack could be mounted. The end of Part 